tell anybody how to think, but we are happy to share information. So if you want to talk to us about throwing a party in your damn town, you'd be happy to do it. And then, uh, so uh, the, the final presentation in this segment uh, is about re reintroducing muscles. And uh, for me, I think the, that's the big winner out of all this uh, river restoration. And just uh, bring it back to Friends of the Fox again. I'm sorry, but we just, uh, we're, we're into this. So uh, this is our T-ball team, the muscles. All right, so Everett, is it Everett? Bring it on. Let's see if I get my microphone up to your face. And uh, just be able to hear these microphone All right. There it is. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me good? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So uh, my name is Everett Krauss. I'll be uh, presenting here on fresh water and marshal propagation, uh, specifically keeping common species common at the Urban Stream Research Center. So I'll begin with giving a little background on the USRC. Uh, we opened in 2012 and we we're un, uh, funded partially by a Superfund project through the uh, EPA and then also an additional grant from uh, NOAA. Um, the Superfund project was meant to restore 8.2 river miles uh, of both the West Branch and its tributary of Crest Creek. Uh, during this restoration, we also removed two dams, which Ryan alluded to the uh, negative impacts of those. The USRC uh, contains the Aquatic Species Recovery Program. This is our freshwater mussel propagation program, as well as our aquatic monitoring and research program, the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly and Great Plains Mudbug Captive Rearing Program, as well as our fisheries and lake management program. We provide a lot of uh, outreach opportunities, including school tours, as well as open houses. And in 2022, we actually welcomed a total of seven schools with uh, a total of about 150 students and another about uh, 150 visitors in our open house. And starting today, we're actually doing our 2023 school tours. So give me a really good reason to be out of the office. <laughs> so here's the big question. Why do we care about freshwater mussels? Well, freshwater mussels uh, provide a lot of ecosystem services, including uh, filtering in between six to 20 uh, gallons of water per mussel per day. And this will vary according to the species as well as the size of the mussel. Now, during this filtering, they'll actually uptake heavy metals, pollutants, chemicals, and pharmaceuticals, as well as consuming the regular diet of zooplankton, detritus, bacteria, diatoms, and algae. Now, again, during, uh, because of this filtering process, they're referred to as the livers of the river or biological water treatment plants. And they provide habitat for aquatic organisms, stabilize riverbeds, as well as provide food for other animals such as otters, raccoons, muskrats. Freshwater mussels are also one of the most imperiled animals in the world. Um, not many people realize this, but uh, numbers have been declining due to pollution, loss of in-stream habitat, dams and impoundments, um, which will limit the migration of their fish hosts, which is a way that they definitely spread around. Um, also stream channelization, invasive species, which will both consume and outcompete freshwater mussels, and also through siltation, which can of course uh, kind of suffocate them if they get covered in silt. Now freshwater mussels have an extremely complicated life cycle. Um, one of the things that makes it so complicated is that it involves an obligate parasitic phase of their life, uh, where they, are, they need to live on the gills and or fins of their host fish. Now, during this time, they'll absorb nutrients from the fish, as well as metamorphose into juvenile mussels before dropping off a couple of weeks later. Now, this is the big question. How do they get on the fish? So there's, I'm gonna go through these slides a little bit quick because I have a video that's gonna explain it better. But uh, generally, there's two different, a uh, couple different techniques that they use. One of them is a lure, which is represented by, uh, you can see the middle photo, that's a plain pocketbook, Lancelos cardium. Uh, you can see there, the, their lure represents a minnow and often draws in their host fish. And then the, uh, in the middle there, you can actually see, this is their marsupial gill, and that's called their glucidia or the uh, mussels larvae. 
Um, in addition to the lure technique, we have a conglutinant technique. Now this is essentially a mucus and glucidia packet that often looks like a prey item for whatever their host fish is. So in the case of these uh, red worms looking things here, that's actually, they're meant to look like uh, blood worms, and for the host fish of this mussel, the uh, creek chub, that is one of their main sources of feed. In the streams of Missouri lives the Lampsilis mussel, a simple animal with an extraordinary life cycle. To reach adulthood, its young must spend part of their lives inside a fish, the largemouth bass. To get there, the mussels must make physical contact, a difficult task, as mussels don't swim. But the bass has a weakness. It's a voracious predator of small fish, particularly darters. Even the slightest wriggle of a darter's tail will attract bass. So here's a Believe it or not, the fish on the mussel is an imitation, Again, we're that a perfect lure replica that will lure that bass will within striking range. Like um, and they'll actually lure the bass in, and you can see it. The mussel can somehow sense approaching fish and wriggles its lure faster to entice them. If it gets the twitching just right, the remarkable likeness should do the rest. On impact, the muscle squirts its young into the bass's mouth. These snap shut on the gills, like spring-loaded traps. Here they stay, drawing blood from the fish, until several weeks later they drop off as tiny, fully formed muscles. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, why do we propagate freshwater mussels? Uh, in the wild, freshwater mussels actually have a very low success rate. We like to say less than 1% because saying that number is a lot more difficult. Uh, but with propagation, we're able to then take that less than 1% survival rate and actually increase it up to 25 to 50%, again, kind of depending on species. Now, our goal, as I mentioned at the uh, USRC, is to keep common species common. And so we're mainly focusing on augmenting uh, native common populations, um, not necessarily doing complete reestablishment of, pop of populations or completely reintroducing populations to the area, but um, keeping those common species common so that we can bolster those ecological uh, services that they provide. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of our propagation process. Uh, every propagation starts out with having to go out and collect both our host fish and our brood stock. Once we collect both of those, we will then extract the glucidia from our mussels, which you can see in that middle photo. We'll, we'll actually take a syringe, poke it into that marsupial gill, uh, spray a little bit of water and all the glucidia will come flowing out. From there, we actually do a, an immersion bath technique to apply the glucidia onto the gills of whatever host fish we're using, which you can see in that picture, all of those little white specks on those gills, those are all mussel larvae that just attached to that fish. From there, uh, we wait for the larvae to drop off as juveniles, um, and we'll then collect those and move those into one of our many rearing systems. Now I'm gonna go through each one of our rearing systems a little bit. Um, Generally, we have two different kinds of rearing systems that we use. We got our indoor systems, which include the ones listed here, as well as our outdoor systems, which I'll get into in a little bit. So I'll start off with our trough system. Our trough system uses a recirculating uh, method, as well as with biofiltration and temperature control. Um, we're able to rear day-old juveniles up to about two millimeters in size using this system. And we add an additional uh, algae diet of reed maricultures, nano 3600, shellfish diet, and TP 1800, which is just 
a bunch of different diatoms, algae, all that kind of stuff. Um, this system also uses a sand substrate, uh, which changes according to the size of the mussel as well as the species that we're producing. This system is based off of a uh, design at the Kentucky Center for Mollusk Conservation. And actually, they just recently modified their system into a pulse flow, which I'll be getting into with this next system. Um, so our beaker system, this is our pulse flow system. This uses a, a water and algae mixture delivered through a motorized ball valve and then distributed to each beaker. Uh, when this mixture is distributed to the beakers, each beaker will receive about a 75% water change as well as additional feed for the mussels. And so it creates a uh, uh, really clean environment as well as like a really high uh, food environment for them. This has actually been our most productive system in recent years, and we've been seeing a lot of success with this. So it's something really exciting that we're actually able to apply the system. In addition to the algae and uh, creek water source that we use on this system, we also provide uh, less than 100 micron sediment for the mussels to actually burrow into, and that provides them with uh, supplemental feed in the form of uh, detritus, bacteria, um, and a, a, another uh, wild algae and stuff like that. Um, next, we have our herbiscus boxes. These are a really, really simple system. Essentially, all it is is a shoebox sized plastic container that has that same silt sediment in the bottom creek water. Um, the really unfortunate thing about these systems is their stagnant nature causes an uh, increase in rotifers to grow in the system, which will often uh, compete with and or kind of clog up muscle movement, uh, causing it so that they aren't really able to eat. So we aren't seeing the best you know, success with this system, but we are continuing to use it and as a kind of tester for new species. Next, we have our bucket system. Now, this is based off of the Barnhart bucket system, uh, first developed by Dr. Chris Barnhart. Um, we made some modifications to better fit our needs. Uh, we use a recirculating method instead of a single stationary bucket. Um, and similar with the sump and biofiltration and temperature control that we have with our trough system. Uh, this also uses an upwelling technique that was devised from uh, oyster cultivation. Uh, and so it's, it's a modification on a modification. We use this system every now and again when we bring in new species, but generally uh, we're kind of phasing it out. Um, and the modifications that we've made allow us to also uh, house brood stock in the system when we need to. Now, this is our pan system. This is uh, so with our rearing systems, there is both a primary and secondary rearing system. This is one of our secondary rearing systems. This system will definitely, uh, will wait till the muscles are at about two millimeters in size and will grow them to about 20 millimeters in size with this system. Um, there's a much higher flow rate in the system. So we have to make sure that our muscles are already siphoning. They can't be pedal feeding still like in our other systems. And so we need to, you know, just make sure they're up to size and, and we'll continue growing them out in here. Now our grow out system, the name is a little bit uh, deceiving. It's not actually used for grow out. We mostly use it for brood stock storage uh, or sub adults that are getting ready to release. Um, we're, we're working on that one as well. There's several systems that need modifications. Uh, up next is our outdoor rearing systems. Now I'm going to kind of brush over the creek system. Again, this is kind of a similar use to our grow out system. Uh, we generally just store mussels in here that we're going to be using for propagation or ones that we're going to be releasing in a short period of time. It just uses fresh water uh, coming from a stream right outside our facility and continues to flow the water through the mussels so that they get plenty of feed. Now this is the really exciting one. So our pond rearing systems use these floating baskets uh, in ponds and will actually grow mussels from that three to five uh, millimeter range that we stock them in the baskets at up to 35 or even in some cases over 40 millimeters in size depending on the species. These are really great, uh, really simple systems. Uh, some facilities have actually had success just tossing mussels in there right off the fish and having them grow out to size. As you can see here, so our bottom left photo is actually what we'll stock the mussels in those baskets at, that three to five millimeters in size, and they'll get up to that uh, right around 20 millimeters in size in those uh, top right uh, photos. 
So what do we do after we grow the muscles? We release them. And we, we have general guidelines for releasing our muscles. We release about a thousand individuals per square 20 meters. And we make sure that each one is tagged with something to recognize them with. Majority of our muscles will end up being tagged with glitter. This is a really easy thing to tag the muscles with. It's just a dollop of super glue, glitter sprinkled on top of it, and they're ready to go out into the wild. Other ways that we have of tagging them include hall print and pit tags. The, both of those are meant for going back and monitoring your muscles for growth, uh, survivability, uh, et cetera. But those pit tags are the exact same chip that go into your uh, dog or cat at the vet to make sure a vet's able to scan it and get all that information. Now at the USRC, we've had uh, variable success when it comes to releasing muscles. Uh, starting out in 2017, we, did, we were able to release 24,000 muscles in, in one year. Uh, since then, we've had a lot of water quality issues as well as a, kind of a trial and error factor to get uh, a more diverse species production than what we were originally running. Uh, as you can see, starting in 2021, we were able to turn that uh, production back around, getting almost up to 500 individuals that we released. And finally, in 2022, we were able to get up to uh, 3,000 individuals. So once we release our individuals, we go back and monitor. Um, generally, we're getting about a 30% recovery rate, which is a little deceiving because these muscles can be drastically upstream or downstream of the release site. We've actually found muscles of river mile downstream from where they were supposed to be. Uh, but we are getting good signs of growth, of reproduction, and uh, lure demonstrations provided by the females that we uh, produced ourselves. Uh, finally, uh, to date, we've released 28,000 mussels from the USRC. Uh, six species were represented in, in these release numbers. And today, our current yearly numbers uh, are 20,000 individuals that we are currently housing in lab. Uh, these individuals are, we're redoing species that we haven't had success with in a little while. On the last slide, I don't know if you saw the white keel splitters, we've only released 92 of them. Uh, and now we have 13,000 in lab that are growing and are already getting to that size that we would stock them into ponds. So we should be getting quite a, a good uh, representation from them uh, that we can stock back out. And finally, these are just some of our partnerships that we've acquired. Uh, we do work with both the uh, Forest Preserve District of Kane County, City of Kankakee, McHenry County Conservation District, and Urban Rivers to stock mussels in their waterways. Uh, Urban Rivers is a nonprofit in the Chicago River that actually does floating wetlands, and they have baskets of our mussels underneath the wetlands. Um, the Shedd Aquarium and Loyola University, we partnered with on some research projects, including a genetics project with the Shedd Aquarium to track the genetics of the mussels that we produce uh, to make sure we aren't skewing too much in one way. Any questions? Yeah. So when the mussels go kill free, they're taking out things. Mm -hmm. What happens to those things? Do they get neutralized? Do they just end up? Right. So, so she was wondering what happens when you actually, when the muscles are filtering, what happens to the materials that they're filtering out of the water? Food items, obviously, we're digesting those. Uh, with the pollutants, they do uh, uptake them. And so it's more, they, they lock them up for a period of time. And then as their tissue breaks down after they die, uh, they will be released back into the water. But some of these muscles that do the most filtering, the really large ones, can have a really long lifespan of upwards of even 100 years at times. So if you're locking up nutrients for 100 years, it's going to work out a lot better than. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How long does it take for larval stage to release? Sure. So, best case scenario, it's about eight months. Worst case scenario, it could be upwards of three years. Uh, it's very dependent on the species, what kind of growth they exhibit. Uh, but we had, um, last year we produced a bunch of giant floaters that started out in January and we released them in October. So are you guys reusing fish then or? That's a really good question. No, we, we don't. Uh, when fish uh, have freshwater mussels attached to the gill, they do develop antibiotics antibodies to fight against that kind of parasitic attack. And so for us to get the best drop off from our fish, we only use them once. Uh, we tend to use smaller fish because the smaller the fish, generally the younger it is, 
and the less likely it is to have had muscles on it uh, a previous time. Yeah. Is, is there any danger of, uh, there's no food plankton um, limitation in any of our rivers for the growth of these things. I mean, there were, I mean, we clean these rivers up, won't there be less stuff to eat or is that just a non-issue? So, I mean, that's a great question, right? Because when we see uh, waterways that are infested with zebra mussels, they're too clean, right? They're, the water's too clear. There's not enough algae production to provide for that uh, lower trophic level of fish, um, which then affects your sport fish and everything that people like catching. Generally, I believe with the lower rate of reproduction of these mussels, as well as the lower rate of filtration i mean compared to an oyster which is able to filter 60 gallons a day per individual uh we're i don't think we're necessarily worried about over cleaning the water so the shed aquarium was just named uh by an international center for freshwater species survival within the past couple of weeks is there uh any hope for getting some of their attention applied to the Fox River watershed? So I can't speak for the Shed Aquarium myself. I can say that the uh, Kantara uh, Inaro uh, is uh, actually our the partner we work with to do the genetic testing of our mussels. And so he has done some work in the Fox, uh, uh, Fox River. Um, but yeah, I can't necessarily guarantee that just because of our partnership that they would work in the Fox. Thanks.